Hello. We're um, beginning here um, a block of five lectures leading up to the end of the course um, about the study of adaptation. Most of the lectures will be about adaptation in particular areas of life, for example, sex differences or health or life histories. Um, today's is uh, about the, the problem um, in its general form, illustrated with a variety of examples um, taken from um, wonderful studies that make a point about how we can study um, adaptation and about the overarching principle that there are always trade-offs in the mix, um, that a, a great deal of adaptation is about um, optimizing uh, two competing uh, goods or aims in some specific uh, context. We're fascinated by um, adaptation, uh, rightly so. Um, it was Darwin's great discovery, how it happens. Um, and it explains how it can be that organisms have evolved um, to be so incredibly complex and um, clever, capable, and in many cases, just breathtakingly beautiful. How does that happen? Um, since we know natural selection is working all the time on everything, it's tempting to um, slide into thinking that, well, essentially everything about an organism must be adaptive. So maybe our job is just to admire the adaptation and make up a nice story about why it's good for the species and um, consider that we've learned something. Well, um, it's not quite that simple, as we'll see. Um, we have to confront um, the, the fact that if we want to have scientific knowledge about adaptation, we have to be very conscious and careful about how we um, conclude that we know what we think we know. And we'll do a bit of that today. And we'll also address the question whether adaptation is an ongoing process for most species or something that happened in their past and now they're just, you know, living off the benefits of having adapted in the past. And the answer, as you're probably aware, is that actually um, there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that it's never ending and that right under our noses um, adaptation is happening. And this is true as we'll see even in our own species, where when I was your age, um, it was frequently said by people who seem to be in the know that we were basically just identical to hunter-gatherers from 100,000 years ago or whatever, um, you know, who had just learned to um, fly airplanes. And um, that view has um, yielded during my career um, to a tremendous amount of evidence that now um, clearly makes the case that, no, we've never stopped evolving and we're actually still doing so today. Um, and, of course, we've already seen examples of very fast um, contemporary um, adaptive evolution um, in the natural selection uh, topic that we considered just a few weeks ago. Here are two figures uh, from those lectures. Um, this one, which you've seen several times, of changes year by year in beak size in Darwin's medium ground finch, studied by the Grants, with this red segment showing the sharp um, increase in beak size, which is paralleled by body size generally in response to the drought of 1977, and then a slower rate of change wandering back toward the vicinity of where the population had been um, before. And the lower peak is just the, my histogram of the rates of evolution in Haldanes that were cataloged by um, Hendry and Kinnison in their classic um, first review of contemporary um, adaptation by natural selection. Well, molecular phenotypes evolve um, rapidly, too. We haven't considered them to this point, and so now we'll look at one anyway that uh, makes um, some very, many of these general um, points. 
Um, this comes from a study by Robin Bush at UC Irvine and several of her colleagues on the proteins of flu virus. Um, they used frozen samples of flu virus, which have been collected since the 60s and actually even earlier, um, to sequence the viral genome and look at the, especially the two proteins that decorate the outside of the envelope of the virus, the hemagglutinin, uh, these rod-shaped things in orange in this cartoon of the virus, um, and also neuraminidase, which we won't go into today, um, which is another one of these um, coat uh, proteins that interact a lot with our immune system. Um, they found that the rate of amino acid substitution in hemagglutinin exceeded um, one substitution per year in the protein most of the time in most lineages. And um, it's a, a key bit of background to their study, something they very cleverly thought to focus on, is the contrast between strains that go extinct, which is the fate of essentially all of them eventually, and those in the stem of retrospectively successful uh, lines of descent that um, provide the viruses um, for today's population. So they, they contrasted, as it were, the winners and the losers, um, the survivors and the extinct. And they found that the surviving lineage, this stem in the middle of the tree, has a vastly higher ratio of amino acid substitutions in the antigenic sites in the protein, the ones that are seen by our immune system, and uh, relative to those at non-antigenic sites, which provide a control um, to help us um, evaluate right, whether a lot of action is going on at these sites that our immune system sees. And the evidence was spectacular um, that they are um, under a lot of selection to adapt, that is to evade our immune system. So um, here in the surviving um, lineage part of this table of numbers of substitutions, which were inferred by analysis of phylogenetic trees, just as we saw um, early in this half of the course, um, a ratio of 33 um, substitutions at the antigenic sites to only 10 at non-antigenic sites, so more than a threefold um, difference in favor of the antigenic sites, whereas in the extinct lines, these um, branches of the tree that came out, survived for a while, made um, um, epidemics, and then um, just faded away and were never seen again. In them, um, there was actually a majority, at least a slight majority, of substitutions were at non-antigenic sites as opposed to the antigenic ones. So that, that pattern of opposite biases is uh, very improbable if nothing interesting was going on, highly statistically significant, and supporting the view that, as I said, the um, amino acids at the antigenic sites, these are the ones colored with dark, well, dark or yellow colors um, in this uh, space-filling molecular model of the hemagglutinin protein, um, those amino acids are constantly evolving adaptively to evade our immune system. And it also is the case that the antigenic sites are evolving at absolutely high rates of substitution relative to all the other non-antigenic um, positions in the protein um, that evolve at some background rate. Okay, so there's a, a great evolution story um, where you can put together all the pieces, the history of what happened, um, together with a model of how it works. Um, but a great deal of selection, actually, is devoted to preventing change, and this, in my view, isn't studied nearly enough. Um, Trade-offs often give rise um, to optima that are intermediate. We've seen a few examples of that before, and thereby to stabilizing selection. And here's a really important um, place where that happens in our species. Um, it's on birth weight of newborns. And you know all the, the, the tremendous advances that medicine has made 
in recent decades and centuries, it still hasn't eliminated what is, to this day, strong stabilizing selection on human birth weight. This um, graph shows um, two figures at once. Um, the gray histogram it just shows you what the distribution of birth weights is. The mode is around seven pounds um, with a mean sort of seven pounds something. And the optimum, based on um, this mortality curve, which is superimposed, the orange curve fitted to these um, spots, which are the data on percent mortality of newborns as a function also of their birth weight, which is on the same scale on the x-axis. Okay, so the minimum mortality is um, what obviously uh, natural selection, and we would prefer the optimum is here at the very bottom of that curve, and it's just slightly above the observed mean birth weight. Um, and in both directions, both um, toward higher birth weights and toward lower birth weights, with equal steepness, um, the mortality rate um, goes up, and it goes up quite a lot, especially at the low birth weight side. So there's a trade-off in there somewhere. Um, what is it? Um, I won't answer it now. You should think about it. You can probably come up with many uh, sort of obvious and testable hypotheses. Something must be worse about being smaller. It's pretty easy to um, come up with candidate mechanisms that would make small size um, risky. Uh, but what about being larger? That's also bad. Okay. So um, is everything being optimized by selection? And the answer is, as we've indicated, no. And here's a wonderful story told at length in the textbook that um, shows how things that look like good hypotheses end up not, sometimes, not being um, backed up by evidence. And so this is a lesson in how we can learn to recognize adaptations, that is, characteristics that were actually assembled by selection for the as-it-were purpose of increasing fitness, even though, of course, it's not a purpose in the human sense. Um, and the tools are not fancy. They are like those of um, forensics, generally. Lots of careful observation. And you've seen some um, studies like this already in the course uh, from the very first day. Let's see a story about the giant velvet mites. Um, shows a method that can be used for figuring out what an adaptation is. There were, was garter snake thermoregulation and so on. Um, experiments are also uh, very powerful where they can be done, um, often through the method of manipulating ecological circumstances on the one hand or the traits themselves to see um, what happens as a result. Um, Phylogenetic comparisons can sometimes be used where experiments simply aren't practical. Um, that is to say, we can use evolution as a natural experiment that's already been done for us. And uh, if we can figure out a way of interpreting um, one story as a control and a closely related story as an experiment, then sometimes we can uh, get very compelling evidence um, for what is an adaptation and how it got made. Um, so here's um, this tale uh, that starts from the question, why forest buffaloes, these are old world, um, real buffaloes, not our bison, um, why do they tolerate these oxpeckers, these birds that hang out on them and um, peck at their skin? Um, it's a popular hypothesis for many years was that they removed ticks um, from the buffaloes because they had been seen a few times to either dislodge ticks or even eat them. But some investigators finally got around to doing the obvious sort of experiment, which involved um, removing the oxpeckers from some individual buffaloes who were in a place where they could be followed and carefully observed. And they did this experiment actually three times and got totally perplexing results with respect to the change in tick load. That's the y-axis scale here. Um, 
over a month after that is from the beginning of the removal of the birds. So in this first experiment, um, the tick loads went up with the treatment that removed the birds, which looks like um, evidence in favor of the hypothesis, but um, they also went up a bit um, on the buffaloes that still had the birds on them, and um, the, there was nothing even hinting at a significant difference between the two rates of increase. No difference there, so no support. Um, then in the next uh, treatment they did, they had a bigger increase in um, ticks on the on the buffalo that did have their birds. So they kept the birds, but got more ticks, which is not good. And the buffaloes from which the birds were removed actually saw a decrease in ticks, which is definitely totally the opposite of what the hypothesis implied. That um, approached significance, but didn't reach it. And again, it's evidence in the wrong direction for the hypothesis. So they did a third treatment. And this time, they got it the other way around. It was, it was in favor of the hypothesis. Tick load went up um, with the removal of the oxpecker birds. And um, tick load went down, yes, by a few. Um, on the buffalo that were allowed to keep their birds, but again, the difference was not significant. So they concluded that the overall pattern, taking all three experiments um, together, was definitely not supportive of that hypothesis at all. Um, and they also, from all this observation, noticed um, that there's a real downside to having the birds on you, which is they peck open wounds in your skin and feed from them which is um, perhaps their number one reason for being there, or at least part of it. Um, and that's unambiguously significant. In all three treatments, it was, you know, th there was a huge and highly significant difference between the buffalo that had birds removed, um, who got almost no wounds, and those with birds who got lots of them. So, um, so that's a, a cost that has to be taken into account. So um, they also noticed, um, I don't know how, that the uh, buffalo that had birds um, were having earwax removed. They had low levels of earwax in all three treatments relative to the buffalo that had the birds removed who accumulated um, much more earwax. So apparently the ox pickers are eating wax out of the ears of the buffalo. Obviously, I mean, that's a real pattern, significant in all three cases, and so overall, wildly significant. But then the question is, um, is it really a benefit? Who knows? Um, they, the authors were unable to prove that it was a good thing for the buffaloes to have their earwax removed. So the possibility is that it just is a symbiosis that the buffalo can't stop and aren't overwhelmingly wildly motivated to stop, and so it goes on. So um, here's a story from very close to home about the hook on the end of the beak. Many birds have this, this almost tooth-like projection on the upper mandible that comes around over the distal tip of the lower mandible. Um, and one hypothesis developed by um, Professor Dale Clayton and his colleagues and students is that its function, it is a tool, and its function is to help the birds um, de-louse themselves by crushing feather lice. Um, and a former graduate student, Brett Moyer, and some other students in the Clayton lab um, trimmed the hooks off the beaks of 26 pigeons um, that were kept um, in the lab and monitored their louse loads. And this became a classic result that got into your textbook. It is a thing of beauty. So here are the two treatments, um, color-coded um, turquoise and red. Um, they, Moyer and friends, um, just filed the um, point, the tooth, off the upper mandible in a lot of birds. Um, so that they looked like this, right? And let's see, this lower beak, the tooth is gone. And so it can't be used as, a, as an anvil against which to crush um, feather lice when you pull them off your feathers. 
um, and in both of the groups that um, had that treatment for many weeks, several months, um, the number of lice on average went up and up and up and up. Then they stopped the trimming for the red group, these ones on top, and allowed them to regrow the hook, which does come back after a few weeks. And during that process, their louse loads plummeted and then leveled off at something more like a typical um, a load for birds in the Clayton Lab um, aviary. So um, that was um, pretty convincing evidence. This was a clicker question last year. The answer is obviously yes. Um, this supports um, the hypothesis that the hook um, is a tool whose primary purpose, if not its only purpose, um, would seem to be um, to help the birds get rid of their lice. Um, here's another classic experiment um, of a more elaborate sort designed to figure out why this species of fly sort of looks like a jumping spider that could be a predator of it and waves its patterned wings in a way that imitates the behavior of the jumping spider. Um, and there is a range of hypotheses, um, including the null hypothesis, there's no particular reason, it's just a habit, and the fly just happens to look like a jumping spider. Hypothesis two, the mimicry deters other predators. Uh, these jumping spiders are ferocious predators, so maybe the fly, which is actually kind of harmless, is getting other potential predators of it um, to think it's a jumping spider and run away. And the third hypothesis is it's actually a behavior to deter the jumping spider who will think, at least for an instant, that the fly might be another jumping spider and not pounce immediately in order to figure out who it is. So what Eric um, did was come up with this beautiful experiment and carry it out. Um, and so this will take a minute to walk through the logic of it, but it's... Um, worth it and necessary. So there were five treatments at all, A through E. Um, the first is um, to just do nothing to the fly, whose genus name is Zonosomata. Just don't treat it. It's um, a control to test the effect of the wing markings and the wing waving. Right, So the, the striking characteristics of the fly are both the patterning of the wings and the way in which the fly waves them in a manner that makes a human think, hmm, it might be imitating the behavior of the jumping spider. Okay, then Eric did a control um, for wing modification in which he cut off the wing of zonosomata flies and then re-glued them right back on. Um, so that's a control for the effects of the wing cutting and gluing operation. Then um, the experiment or uh, one of the experimental treatments that this is a control for, which is to take a zonosomata fly, cut off its wing, and replace it with unpatterned housefly wings. So that preserves the behavior, the wing waving, but gets rid of the visual um, pattern of, of stripes. Then there's the converse treatment. The housefly, who donated its wings for this experiment, gets... Um, the pattern wings of Zonosomata, so it doesn't have the wing waving behavior, but it does have the pattern wings of the Zonosomata fly. And then there's the untreated um, housefly control, um, which has neither wing markings nor wing waving. All right, so we have these five um, forms of flies, manipulated and not. And then predictions under the three hypotheses as to what will happen um, when a jumping spider is presented with one of these flies. So under the, uh, oh, it's just an accident hypothesis, in all conditions, we expect the jumping spider to attack or attempt to attack the fly that it fi finds close to it. Um, and we also expect that other predators um, would likewise just attack the fly if the fly is a suitable prey for them. Under the uh, second hypothesis, that the mimicry is a deterrent um, to other predators, 
not to the jumping spider. That is, that Zonosomata is trying to make other predators think it's a ferocious jumping spider and they had better get out of there fast. Well, um, the jumping spider won't be fooled. It knows it's not a real jumping spider, so it should attack um, in all cases, as under hypothesis one. But the other predators should be um, frightened and retreat, at least when they first see either um, the untreated or the control re-glued um, Zonosomata flies. Okay, and the converse should happen under hypothesis three, which is, remember, that the mimicry is meant to deter the jumping spiders themselves. Um, under that hypothesis, the jumping spider will be fooled and will retreat. The other predators won't because they don't know what this is supposed to look like. And um, both predators will continue to attack um, the controls that are up part or entirely housefly. Okay, so what happened? Here are the results. They're in your textbook, but they're also here, and um, you can work on this at your leisure. Um, what Eric did was present each of 20 jumping spiders with one fly each of all five kinds, A through H. The bar graphs show um, the number of um, cases in which the jumping spider responded, for example, by retreating, which it did, to A and B, not every time, but in 15 of the 20 cases, the jumping spiders did retreat when they saw Zonosomata or the Zonosomata with its own wings re-glued, but it never retreated much, uh, maybe a few times, but not often, um, to C, D, and E. Um, it um, stalked and attacked um, the uh, house flies or house fly lookalikes, um, and it succeeded in killing them all um, a fair fraction of the time. So um, the other predators aren't shown here because it was uniform. They ate any of the flies efficiently and without discrimination whenever they were given the chance to do so. So here are the five conclusions um, that you should um, think about um, in, in going back and reviewing this on the slides, say. Um, um, you can then also look in uh, the textbook and see how um, green and how your textbook authors interpret it. But I think it should be pretty obvious um, from this um, that there's a uh, a very specific adaptive hypothesis um, for the behavior and the looks of Zonosomata that is upheld um, by these results. Okay, so let's stop there, take a break, and come back and in the second half of this lecture um, talk about how trade-offs come in and how thinking about and testing for consequences of trade-offs plays a role in establishing adaptation.